We have a very special guest today on One Take. He's a filmmaker and someone who has worn many hats in the filmmaking world. He wrote Pandorum, and more recently, he wrote and directed Infinity Chamber, a movie I highly recommend. It's a fantastic psychological sci-fi thriller, and people who watch this channel know that I love sci-fi, especially when it can successfully blend a sense of discovery with some thought-provoking questions and an emotional human core at the center of it. Writer-director Travis Malloy did exactly that with Infinity Chamber, and I'm excited to talk with him today. So, Travis, welcome to the show. Thank, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Definitely. And uh, I feel like most conversations now kind of start a similar way, where you have to ask, uh, how are you? How are you doing with... Um, covid the lockdowns have you found a way to maintain your sanity and some kind of a schedule yeah absolutely i appreciate it well it's uh, uh being a writer mainly at, at my core is uh it doesn't change my world too much I'm, mm -hmm. i spend a lot of time in a dark space sitting in front of a computer so being isolated hasn't uh hasn't changed that much so mm -hmm. trying to get as much work done as i can and we're really trying to figure out how to approach kind of this new era uh, of right. filmmaking, how we can do it safely. Um, so we're all kind of scrambling to try to figure that out. And um, actually, uh, speaking of writing, that was one of the things I wanted to ask you about. Uh, I was reading one of your interviews about Pandorum, where you talked about how you took a sort of unorthodox approach to writing that, where it yeah. sounded like you didn't have too much of an outline. You kind of sat down and went wherever the story took you. And I'm curious, you know, that was a couple years back. Has your writing process do you have a preferred method for writing or does it sort of differ from one project to the next? Uh, it does differ, but that, uh, uh, yeah, that did change the whole way that I write. Um, I, before, uh, long story short, um, I was working as a writer in LA and working on lots of projects, but I was, I was having a tough time. And I always did the traditional route where I would do an, out, uh, an outline and break it down. And then just kind of out of uh, irritation, I said, you know what, I'm just going to try this a different method. I'm going to try to write a movie as a viewer. As it goes along, I have no idea where it's going. And it's kind of a dangerous way to write because you can easily paint yourself into a corner. Mm -hmm. um, but it worked. Um, and that's now I basically that's what I do now. The problem, it's great because you can come up with some really incredible things, but the downside is I have dozens and dozens of scripts that stopped halfway through mm. because I ran into a, I ran into a wall and I didn't know how to finish them. Gotcha. Um, but, but yeah, that is, that's, I, I, I consider it a very organic approach. It's kind of a dangerous way to write, but I like to just jump in as if I'm watching the movie and just see where it goes. That's interesting. You know, it actually reminds me, I might be um, misattributing this quote, but it might have been Jim Davis, you know, the author of Garfield. And I think he talked about the fact that at a certain point, he gets to know his characters so well that he'll sort of just sit there and watch it play out. And then when something right. funny happens, he writes it down. So it sounds like you have sort of a similar approach. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it, it's really about finding the voice for the characters and you know, setting up a scenario and then it does, there's this weird feeling where they kind of take over where you're, you're just watching from the sidelines. So it's, it's kind of rare when that happens, but when it does, it's, it's really magical. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really great. Yeah. And I wanted to ask, um, I, so I mentioned, you know, in the introduction, I said you wore a lot of hats, uh, in the filmmaking world. And I think I read in an interview about how you got started, you did a lot of different things. I would love yeah. to hear a little bit about your story of just how you got into the world of filmmaking, what drew you in, and how did you get started? Oh, right on. Well, you know, I grew up, uh, I grew up in Minnesota. Um, I went to college in Minneapolis, and I, um, I worked uh, for Prince out at Paisley Park, mm -hmm. and I really just kind of dove into the industry. I tried to do all... Uh, any any department working with art department or as a PA as a camera and stunts and special effects and I basically just tried to gobble up everything uh, that I could find. My first film I did an indie film with my friends, very low budget. I came out to Hollywood, uh, we sold the film, and then I met a big agent and he actually 
I wanted to be a director. And he said, no, I'm not going to represent you as a director, but I'll represent you as a writer. And I was like, well, I'm not really a writer. That's, you know, I didn't consider that path. But he said, no, that's, I like what you, I like what you've written. Mm -hmm. Um, So he kind of pulled me in that direction. So that kind of became my career Mm -hmm. and found out I had a little bit of a knack for it. So I kind of fell into it by accident. Gotcha. And yeah. uh, you actually mentioned something I wanted to ask about. Just when I was looking at your credits, I saw those stunt credits. What kind of um, stunt work were you doing early on? Yeah, that was that. That was just kind of young and dumb, fun times. I worked. <laughs> for, uh, <laughs> it was a career I realized I did not want to do. Mm-hmm. You know, once I got it, it was it was fun when you're young and doing stunts and car gags and high falls and fire stuff and all. It was just. It was a lot of fun to do, but I quickly realized I wanted to be behind camera. That uh, that was a rough that was a rough way to make a living. Yeah. But it, but it, but it was fun. It, it kind of scratched that itch. Did some like bridge jumps and just kind of foolish stuff when I was younger. But right, I quickly, right. I quickly veered out of that into the more creative, into the writing and the directing aspects. Right. You'd rather be the guy behind the camera watching somebody jump off a cliff than being the one doing the jumping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. But I got it out of my system, you know. Right, did, right. Did enough, did enough to have some fun, uh, <laughs> but the, but then got into different aspects of production. And yeah. is uh, is directing still the part you enjoy most? Because I know you've you've done a lot of writing. It sounds like so. Have you grown to appreciate the writing more than you did kind of at the beginning of it all? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's it it's definitely. Uh, Actually, you know, writing is is really the thing that I'm drawn to Hmm. Um, just because directing is very rare. It's very, you know, it's a very it's a very special gift to get the opportunity to direct a film. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a really tough industry. So that comes along every once in a while in a blue moon, you know. So the writing I'm really drawn to is trying to tell a compelling story, trying to work within interesting guidelines Mm -hmm. you know and a lot of time i compare like novelists to screenwriters i can't imagine writing a novel because you can go anywhere you can express any thought etc etc but screenwriting is very restrictive Mm -hmm. you have Mm -hmm. to tell a compelling you can't convey thought you have to just show a blueprint of what you see and what people say and it has to be within you know, 100, 105 pages and a three act structure and stuff like that. So I really like being forced to try to tell something compelling under those restrictions. Mm-hmm. I find it I find it an interesting challenge. And now in this era of doing very self-contained movies, low budget films that are easy to do with low number of characters, I, I really like that challenge of trying to to do something uh, with very little resources. Right. And and I think that's a really good segue to talk about infinity chamber. I was reading a little bit about, um, you said something about how you can wait until you have the right budget or you can wait for the opportunity to direct, but you sort of decided I'm going to do it. I'm going to make infinity chamber no matter what it takes. And I would love just for the jolt of motivation I'll get from hearing it and other people will get. I'd love to hear a little bit about how you decided it's time to make this movie and how you got it done. Yeah, no, that's 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 an interesting part of it. I mean, Hollywood uh, filmmaking is very I mean, it's a big endeavor. You, mm-hmm. you put your life on hold. You put a lot of energy into something like that. So it's really easy to procrastinate. It's like, oh, when the kids are out of school or when I have more money or in the summer or whatever. So it's so easy to procrastinate. So I, and I knew that. So I was like, all right, I'm going to force my own hand. And I decided I rented a little storage space and I started building the set for the movie. And I didn't even have a finished script, Mm -hmm. but I just knew that if I started and I was spending money to rent this space and putting this energy into the project, I'd be a fool not to make the movie after a few months or six months or whatever. So that was, I just made that decision and kind of took that leap of faith. It took me a year to build that set. Mm -hmm. And I was writing the script while I was doing it. Uh, It was really interesting to be in that place building it myself and then thinking about that story and, and, and carving it out to make it fit what I was doing. So anyway, that's 
that is how it worked. And it was kind of like stone soup because people were coming to see what I was doing and thinking I was foolish. Like, well, what are you doing? Well, you know, wait a minute. What are you? Because normally the traditional way is, all right, here's my script. Here's my project. Now I have to go present it to financiers and go do the traditional route. But I kind of reverse engineered it. It's like, no, I'm just I'm just going to start making a movie. Um, I had no money, I had no cast, I had no crew, whatever, but slowly people were very interested in what I was doing. And by the time I finished building the set, I had the financing and the crew and the cast. And mm. then we, we were off, off to the races. It's got to be pretty um, helpful, too, to be able to work on the script while sitting in the physical space where the movie's actually going to take place. That's got to be yeah. a pretty unique experience. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny because in Infinity Chamber... I believe he spends two years in the cell in the story. And I realized that I spent about as much time in that space as the character did in the movie. So, yeah, it was it was very, very surreal experience. Yeah, it's great. That's great. It's probably, unfortunately, a method of writing. That's probably not something you can replicate over and over. You know, James Cameron creating Pandora for uh, Avatar, live there for a while and then write right. the script. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It was a, it was a, it was, you know what? If, if, I mean, not to get nutty, but it felt like I earned the movie mm -hmm. because I built that place myself. I mean, it was, uh, I, 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 cre I had to make creative choices and the aesthetic and all that kind of stuff. And I explore, I, like I dumpster dived and I looked, tried to find all these items. And, but by the time the set was complete and we were filming, I really felt like I earned it. It's not like, you know, we used some money and we hired some crew to go build it. And then, all right, let's roll in and make this movie. I just felt, I felt part of that place. Yeah. And it yeah. definitely showed on screen. And, you know, you referred to the fact that there's, it, the movie mostly takes place in the one location, but it doesn't right. feel like a small movie. It feels like there's a whole world around it. You, there's, there's references to this sort of dystopian government that's taken over. And uh, so it feels like a bigger movie a bigger world that we're seeing this kind of slice of. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I knew that that was the challenge. One of the ch was, uh, okay, how to tell a, uh, an interesting story under those guidelines. But I knew I needed to break out of that room so we wouldn't be that claustrophobic. So mm -hmm. to me, it's a very, very small movie in disguise. I was able to write the story that, you know, with... The, the 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 device that took him to the flashback to his apartment to the coffee shop the escape sequences like I could do these grand breaths of fresh air uh, to to get out of the, to break out of that room but really when you break it down majority of that movie is one guy in this small room talking to a device mm -hmm. so it was my way of disguising trying to make a bigger movie out of something very small. And is that how the, so one thing I wanted to ask about was the, the mechanic you just mentioned of him sort of reliving that memory and those memories over and over. You know, I know um, you talked a little bit in um, some other interviews about the inception of the uh, idea for this movie, where I think you read an article about automation coming into prisons. But yeah. I'm curious, when did the mechanic of the diving back into his memories and reliving them, where, when did that idea come to you as part of the story? You know, it was interesting. It was it was kind of twofold. One one, I liked the Groundhog Day aspect of it because I could get a lot of bang for my buck. Shooting the same sequence over and over and over gave me a lot of footage to work with without moving locations and change. Right. So, a little bit. I'm taking a, down tips. Yeah, it was a little bit of a cheat. Like, well, wow, if it, if I'm doing a Groundhog Day thing, then him getting up in the morning and going to the coffee shop, I'm using that sequence over and over and over. Well, I don't have to set, do a new set, a new camera setup, and I have to do a location change so I can get a lot out of that. That was one just technical aspect, but the other aspect was him struggling with this very interesting dilemma of being stuck in his own his own slice of memory. I just thought that that was that would be a, a very easy dilemma. To pull off technically, but an interesting psychological battle for him. Right. Yeah, and I, I thought it worked really well. It's as the movie starts, no part of me expected 
that a sort of love story would play into this at all, um, but it kind of sneaks up on you. And that's what I was trying to say earlier in my, my favorite Sometimes with sci-fi, it's easy to get stuck on the concept and focused on that. But the best movies are the ones that have that emotional core. So you're actually invested in the character. And uh, I thought it worked really well here. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks. I really appreciate it. You know, I mean, we, you know, it's just it's tr we tried our best to do something. You know, you always try to do something that's unique. You try to do something that resonates with people. Mm -hmm. uh, it was interesting because it started out as primarily an escape movie. Mm -hmm. It's a guy trying to get out of a room. And that's really where it starts. But then as we're, as we were, even while we were shooting the film, then these other elements started to seep in. Like, that's really interesting, this relationship that he has. And, and I always thought it was, in, sometimes you don't know the theme of your movie, even when you're going in. It's great if you do, but I didn't really know the theme of this movie. And as soon as he started communicating, as soon as he started talking to Howard and and we did the scenes with between him and Gabby, I was like, this is really a movie about relationships, about uh, relation, uh, artificial relationships, um, dealing with and, and how we communicate uh, with technology, with with texting and emailing and, and Skyping and all this kind of stuff that our relationships are very filtered through technology. So I was like, he has these two artificial relationships that are very similar, um, but how he deals with them, he deals with them differently in order to get out of his limit. So anyway, it was, it was an interesting, it was kind of an aha moment while shooting, like, wait a minute, there's something, there's something more going on here than just an escape. Movie. Right, and that, that theme was something I was thinking about after I watched the movie. Because um, at least one of the takeaways that I that I took when I after I watched it is Howard is um, someone that get he's a purely artificial intelligence gets kind of close to forming a real relationship with Frank, but at a certain point you see the limitations of it when he starts to repeat over and over, yes Frank, yes Frank. <laughs> right. um, but then you have this slightly more real relationship. It's still. Um, somebody that's in his own mind, Gabby, filtered kind of through the machine. And that's where the relationship feels a little bit more real, almost to the point where if Frank had decided, I'm going to stay here and just live inside my own mind, you could almost understand that decision. And I can relate both of those into, uh, into our world. It's like you mentioned before, I have those friends who will constantly be looking at their phone, texting while I'm trying to have a conversation with them. And that feels like the Gabby side of it. They're talking to this person who's real but filtered through technology. The Howard of it all feels like we haven't quite gotten there yet where there's a machine that can completely fulfill your sort of social needs. But uh, I have a feeling we'll get there eventually. I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. It was, in, you know, the other thing that was interesting was uh, originally Gabby, she was trying to get the information out of him. And it was weird. It was interesting because while filming, I changed my mind. I was like, there's something I really like this relationship. And it's, she really kind of serves as his alter ego. Mm -hmm. It's really in a way for him to talk to himself, the way she challenges his decisions and questions him. To me, it's more of an alter ego. But anyway, there, I just thought there was something really, there was really something sweet about this, this relationship. So I took out the part of her being a villain because it, and I realized there's really no villain in the movie. The villain is, is is a little more obscure it's the it's the the government it's the the system the you know that kind of thing but i was like i don't know am i taking a chance if i don't really have a clear-cut antagonist to the story um but it was just a decision we made to try to go with it and see if it worked but uh, i just liked it a lot better that neither howard or gabby were villains in the story they both wanted the same thing for him yeah, I think that I think that worked, especially uh, if you think about, and I, you know, I know some of this is me just adding my own thoughts to it. But if I draw a parallel to the real world, if computers, if you had the Skynet of computers taking over one day, it might feel like there was no villain. You know, every human involved had the best intentions, and the system kind of took on a life of its own. Right. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Uh, I, I wanted to ask about Howard because he quickly became one of my favorite artificial intelligence companions. Just the, the perfect balance of being a little bit human, a little bit computer, had a slight little bit of sarcasm. So how did you get the Howard personality right? Did you know it going in? Did you kind of feel it out as you went along? That was tough. It was tough because, the, you you know, we're modeled after great artificial characters, you know, from, from Hal to, you know, all, all these different computerized personalities. So <laughs> I wanted to play homage to that, but how to make him a little bit differently if he sounded too robotic or if he sounded too human. So it was, it was a interesting trying to find that balance. And I honestly, I didn't know his voice when we shot it. I didn't know who I was going to use as the voice. And we had Jesse arrow, um, on set so that Chris would have somebody to, to read off. Mm -hmm. But I honestly didn't consider Jesse as the voice of Howard. Um, and then in post, I had Jesse's recording. So I was using him to edit the film, and then I, we were auditioning voice actors, and I listened to dozens and dozens of people. Um, but I was so used to Jesse's voice, like, th that's, that, that's Howard. So anyway, I, little did I know, Howard was sitting next to me the whole time. But I, I thought that he, there was something he did in his delivery that was kind of ominously artificial but then moments of personality um i thought that was that added a nice charm but it was also really creepy yeah definitely it added um some humor at times to the movie that i wouldn't have expected going in i watched it yeah. without uh, my family and there were a few kind of laugh out loud moments with howard that i thought worked really well that's awesome that's awesome uh, i had kind of one more question i wanted to ask you uh, about infinity chamber which is uh, any time a movie ends with some ambiguity, it's always tempting to ask for the definitive explanation, which I won't do, but I was just curious how you decided to end on a slightly more open-ended note where it could be read optimistically, it could be read pessimistically, it's kind of multiple reads. Did you know going in it was going to end on a little bit of an ambiguous note, or was this, again, something you felt out as you were making the movie? Yeah, no, for sure. It was... Uh... It was definitely intentional, and I, I, I'll, I'll be completely honest with you because the, um, the people have asked me about that before. It is, and it's funny because it sounds like such a bullshit answer, but I wanted there to be two possible endings for the film, and I wanted the audience to decide for themselves. Mm -hmm. I, I, I personally have a thought. I mean, there's really it's really kind of come down to two different scenarios that he actually did get out. He actually got that the society had changed and that he actually found the real girl who was that piece of memory that he'd been living with inside the cell. The other version is that a much darker one that he accepted his fate that he was never going to get out. He gave up the information to the computer that it was looking for and it rewarded him with this existence still inside the cell, but he was able to embrace this artificial character that he'd created. So there's two versions, but it was interesting because when I wrote when I wrote the script, I have two different groups of friends in my life. I have friends that love darker, more ominous type endings, and then I have friends and family that really don't like that, and they like the you know, something a little more feel good. So I really was trying, I was kind of being greedy and I was trying to appease both groups. And I really think that the movie is, belongs to the audience. You know, how you react, how you feel about a movie belongs to, belongs to you. So it's interesting when I watch the movie, I, whether I'm in a good mood or what, whatever, sometimes I'll go with that ending. Like mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's how, that's how that works for me. And then sometimes like, no, I think this is the way it is. It's so it's, I just tried to do something where the audience could have something to discuss at the end and decide for themselves what it, kind of ending they wanted. It's funny because when I look at some uh, online discussions about the ending, I don't see a lot of, here's what I think. I see a lot of definitive 
you know, this is what happened because you can see these clues or this is what happened. So I think right. it thread the needle pretty well where you can, you can walk away pretty confident in your read of that ending. And um, I was thinking okay. about my read on it. And I think when I was younger, I probably would have been part of the group of friends you mentioned that are more pessimistic. I would have read it that way. Now I think I'm more optimistic. So I read it as a very positive ending. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to choose to live with that, that interpretation. There you go. Well, and then my argument is, is that actually there is a positive side to both, mm -hmm. even that we and whether it's about finding inner peace, whether it's finding, you know, being able to to live your life on your own terms. So, you know, there's there, there's there's room to move there. But um, but yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. Um, it's been a, it's actually I never expected. I mean, this is a very little movie. Mm hmm. We did. I did not expect uh, the reaction that it would have. I did, I never expected, and not the the fans to discuss very heated debates about the cer certain elements of it. So that's just been absolutely wonderful. Um, you know, you try your best. Movies are a long shot. Some some are quickly easily forgotten um, and never seen by the audience. But so I, w I was really lucky to have to get get some that to, the, the film found its audience and found its path in a certain way. So that, that was awesome. And that's what makes my day is I is getting emails from people all around the world that just want to talk about the movie. I mean, that's, you can't any, ask for anything better than that. That's awesome. And uh, it's just awesome to hear how the movie came together. And it sounds like it's such a combination of just, purely what was in your imagination. Then as you start to make it, some of it is happenstance, what your limitations are, what you have to work with. Some of it is ideas that organically grew out of it. So it's just so cool to hear how all those elements came together to form this awesome movie that uh, hopefully we can get, um, I, I'll, I'll feel very happy with how this goes if we can get in the comments on YouTube, just a good argument going about that ending and a good uh, heated debate. Yeah, that'd be great, absolutely. Um, yeah, it was, you know what, it was, it was, a, a lot of people really gave, sacrificed a lot. A lot of people worked really hard, uh, and, and we were all really proud of what we accomplished. It's, you know, uh, under a very limited budget, um, really kind of a garage band style film. So, uh, it was a, it was a really great journey. That's for sure. I'm really proud of it. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing it with us. And uh, I think one more question I wanted oh. to ask is... Uh, Did I just... lose you, Gil? Hey. hey. Hey, sorry about that. No, I thought that was me. I was like, oh. oh, oh. <laughs> that is just like we <laughs> talked about. Technology is already turning on us. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. Well, I, I pretty much just wanted to wrap up. And I just wanted to thank you for coming on and uh, just sharing that whole journey with us. Like I said... Just oh. hearing how the movie all came together is insightful and it's just motivating. And for me and I think for others listening, it'll just be motivation to uh, do that movie we've wanted to do or whatever we've had in mind for all for so long. And just like you said, stop procrastinating. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, it, it's really it's really exciting time to be a filmmaker. I mean, it, it, there's there's just it hasn't been a time like this. The technology has gotten inexpensive and has gotten really powerful. I mean, you can make a movie with what you can put into a backpack. So mm -hmm. it really, it's about content. And I, there's just gonna be some really interesting, especially now, unfortunately with the pandemic, there, the that big where you, you know, hundred million dollar projects, I think are gonna be limited. It's gonna come down to these smaller stories that have to go inward with story instead of outward with spectacle. Um, so I just I'm really excited about the independent film world right now, and there's I just think there's going to be some great stuff, and it's a great time for for people who want to go make that make that movie. Now uh, now's a great time to do it. So. Awesome. And uh, actually, speaking of which, do you have any anything in the works that you're ready to talk about? Anything you can give us a little preview of what's next? You know, yeah, definitely. It's 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 tough trying to figure out with the pandemic how we're going to mm -hmm. proceed. But I definitely have I have a handful of projects that I'm pursuing. So we're just still trying to figure out which one makes sense and how we can do those things. Um, but yeah, and I can't nothing nothing I can give you specific about because I haven't really decided. 
on which project we're going to pursue, but I've got a few scripts out there with other directors mm -hmm. that are putting projects together and then some of my own little passion projects. So definitely uh, trying to get into production sometime in the next few months. Awesome. Well, I'm very excited to see whatever you do next. And maybe when the time is right, we can have you on again to talk about uh, one of your next projects. Absolutely, man. Anytime. I appreciate it. It's, uh, it's great talking about the project. So uh, thank, thanks, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate it. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on. And for uh, anyone that's watched, if you haven't done it already, please check out Infinity Chamber. I personally watched it on Amazon Prime. So if you're a subscriber, then you have no excuse. You can go watch it right now. So thank you again for joining Travis. And hopefully we'll talk again soon. Excellent, man. Thanks so much.